मधुपातायते मधुक्षर सिंधव मध्वीर्न सतोषधी मधुनक्तम उतोषसी मधुमत्थिव गुम्रज मधुदौरस्तु न पिता मधुमो वनस्पतिर्मधुमाघुमस्तु सूर्ज मध्वीर्गा बहुभवंतु न ओम शांति 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 मे द विंग्स ब्लौ स्वीटली मे दि रिवर्स फ्लो स्वीटली मे प्लैंड एंड अर्थ बी स्वीट वस मे जेज एंड नाइट्स बी स्वीट वस मे दि हेवन दट प्रोटेक्ट अस बी स्वीट वस मे दि सन शाइन ऑन अस स्वीटली मे दि जस्ट ऑफ दि अर्थ बी स्वीट वस मे दि काउज इल स्वीट मिल टू अस लेट ऑल बींग्स बी हैप्पी Let all beings be peaceful. Let all beings be blissful. Home, peace, 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 peace. Friends, this morning we have a special guest speaker, John Mange. is from california he will present houston and smith and vedant last year marked the 70th anniversary of houston smith's 1947 hitchhiking trip from denver where he was teaching at the time to tribuco college as it was called then to meet gerald hurd it was houston's first face to face meeting with a vedantist which shortly led to Aldous Huxley and Swami Satprakashananda in St. Louis. Association with these three influential Vedantists largely shaped the direction and personal life and career uh, of Houston. As much as possible, I'm going to let Houston speak for himself, including this introduction, for reasons you'll understand soon. Uh, I was asked uh, in the moments before we came to order, uh, how would you like to be introduced? And I said, uh, well, folks, here's Houston Smith, and let it go. Uh, I said, anything more you say takes time away from me. Well, well that didn't go very well so i had a backup i said okay here's my alternative uh let me introduce myself and that flew and so uh one of the reasons i like to introduce myself is that introductions always have so much hype in them i mean that's the nature of the game uh uh who's going to ever ever say well ladies and gentlemen here is professor smith he's not much but he was the best our honorarium could afford <laughs> you know that doesn't go uh and so uh those uh superlative uh really work against me one of the things i've been trying to do recently is to reduce the size of my ego <laughs> and lavish introductions to uh work against that <laughs> I'm Houston Smith. I was born in traditional China of uh, Methodist missionary parent and um <clears throat> I uh from as far back as I can remember my guiding star what I wanted to do most in my life 
was to know the truth with a capital T. Uh, meaning by that, the big picture, the widest angle then we could get on the nature of ultimate reality. You're going to see a much more elaborate introduction, sometimes heaped with great praise, and we'll also see a lot more detail about Houston's life. He was immersed in his personal spiritual practices. When not teaching about the world's religion, he was learning about them from deep associations with masters in the various religions of the world. He also believed, wrote, and taught about the significance of the perennial philosophy, which he felt was the foundational core of all religions, which is defined as the spiritual truth that are revealed in all religions throughout history. In the 1940s and 50s, average Americans started to become aware of Eastern religions. Today's subject, Professor Houston Smith, was a highly influential author, lecturer, and TV personality who presented Vedanta, Buddhism, and Islam to the post-war uh, war American public. What's not to, uh, known to most people is that the early and lasting influence on Houston came directly from the Ramakrishna Vedanta movement. We see evidence of that lasting Vedantic influence in today's yoga studios in our language with words like karma, guru, pundit, reincarnation, the individual pursuit of spirituality, meditation, and the acceptance that all religions lead to God, the perennial philosophy. The original sources of that influence in the U.S. is almost forgotten today. Houston's spiritual teacher, Swami Satprakashananda of St. Louis, predicted this when he was asked, will Vedanta take root in the West? The Swami replied, yes, but the source will not be known. While the Ramakrishna Vedanta movement can't take all the credit, it's certainly one of the earliest far-reaching and most persisting sources. The transcendentalists and the theosophists certainly helped prepare the ground for what would come later. The order's work in the West was originally established by the five direct disciples of Ramakrishna who came here to create Vedanta centers and teach the truths they learned from their master, Sri Ramakrishna. Swami Vivekananda was the first speaking at the 1893 Parliament of Religions in Chicago. The stated purpose of the Parliament was to showcase the various religions of the world as equals, but only Vedanta has those ideals explicitly held in its philosophy and scripture. While in the U.S., Vivekananda established the New York and San Francisco centers, he was followed by four other direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, Swamis Sardananda, Turiyananda, Trigunatitananda, and Abedananda. As membership in the Vedanta societies grew, the next generation of Swamis established more centers around the country. Three Swamis in particular attracted the attention of some of the leading Western authors of the time. Swami Prabhavananda, a disciple of Swami Brahmananda, Swami Satprakashananda, also a disciple of Brahmananda, and Swami Nikilananda, who is a disciple of Holy Mother Sri Sarda Devi. The authors who studied under these Swamis contributed greatly to the introduction of Vedanta philosophy to the broader American public. In Hollywood, under Swami Prabhavananda, Aldous Huxley and Christopher Isherwood introduced Vedanta to their readers, most notably Huxley's perennial philosophy and Isherwood's collaboration with Swami Prabhupada on translations of Vedantic scripture. While a student of Nikilananda in New York, J.D. Salinger weaved quotes from Sri Ramakrishna and Vivekananda into his later works, in particular the Glass family stories. Mythologist Joseph Campbell greatly helped with editing the Nikilananda translation of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna and for a time was president of the New York Center. But today I'm going to focus on Houston Smith, a student of Swami Satprakashananda. Millions of Americans came to know about Smith through the work of journalist and author Bill Moyers. Hello, I'm Bill Moyers. When it comes to the comparative study of religion, Houston Smith literally wrote the book. The World's Religions, or The Religion of Man as it was once titled, has been a perennial bestseller for decades and a staple of Introduction to Religion courses. I remember reading it when I was a young seminarian almost 50 years ago. Few books have so informed my life in government, publishing, and journalism. Houston Smith opened my mind to the power of religion in cultures the world over and their impact on human events. 
widely acclaimed and popular, Houston Smith is, in my opinion, the most influential religious scholar of the 20th century. Houston would have blushed and waved off uh, being called the most influential religious scholar of the 20th century, but it's not hype. He made interreligious studies accessible with humor, insight, and the depth of knowledge that came from decades of studying and practicing spirituality under the masters of each of the religions of the world. Houston's books have sold millions of copies over the last six decades, many of which became required textbooks at leading universities. His TV shows and interviews have been seen by millions more. Yet few of his fans know that he's a self-proclaimed Vedantist, specifically a Christian Vedantist. Let's get into his biography and see how Houston's view of God and religion have evolved. Houston Smith was born in 1919 in rural China to missionary parents. His family was very well respected and lived their Christian religious beliefs, helping the poor and teaching by example. In all his explorations of the world's religions, Houston never had cause to give up his bedrock Christian roots. When I came to this country, why, uh, at first I thought I was going right back as a missionary. How old were you then? I was 17, and my only American male role model was my father. And so I grew up assuming that missionaries were what American boys grew up to be. But I was totally unprepared for the dynamism of the West. You know, never mind that it was Central Methodist College, enrollment 600, uh, in Fayette, Missouri, population 3,000. Uh, compared with Podunk, China, it was the big time and the bright light, and by two weeks, uh, China had faded into a happy memory. I wasn't going to squander my life in the backwaters of rural China. But I just moved over uh, across the street, so to speak, um, and I'd be a minister. Then something happened in my junior year, and I ended trying to get out (laughs) of as many organizations as I could in order to focus on my studies. Why? What happened? Well, what happened was there was a little discussion group that the philosophy professor organized, you know, and on. And once a month, why, he would have us over and we would discuss a philosophical issue. I suppose it must have been mounting in me all evening. As we walked back to our dormitory, a little cluster of us, four or five, uh, stood in the dorm hall until after midnight just hammer and tongue, talking about these uh, as uh, (laughs) unlikely a group of peripatetics as you would find anywhere. But it kept on going as I went alone to my room until, I don't know when, maybe around one or two o'clock, it's just like my mind detonated, uh, demolishing mental stockade. And it was almost like a mystical experience. Uh, Like ideas were almost visible. The platonic forms were out there. You could almost touch it. And just uh, receding from me endlessly. I wonder if I slept at all that night. But that was a changing point. And after that, why, never mind the organization, to focus on this. And that has stayed in play. That has been, you know, the life, uh, life-giving lure. Sometime during his undergraduate studies, Houston became attracted to the religious philosophy of Henry Nelson Wyman, whose personal beliefs are described as theocentric naturalism. God is behind all existence, but only natural laws and physical forces operate in the universe, as opposed to actions caused by a supernatural being. After World War II, science, the scientific method, and materialism were becoming the dominant philosophy of our country. 
Houston attended graduate school at the University of Chicago under the direction of noted religious thinker Henry Nelson Wyman, who was instrumental in shaping thinking about religious naturalism. He wrote, it's impossible to gain knowledge of the total cosmos or to have any understanding of the infinity transcending the cosmos. Consequently, beliefs about these matters are illusions, cherished for their utility in producing desired states of mind. During this time in Chicago, Houston met Wyman's daughter, Eleanor, now Kendra. They were married in 1943. Karen, the first of three daughters, was born in 1944, followed by Gail in 1947, and Kim in 1949. While doing research for his doctoral thesis, Houston was looking for books on the subject of pain and happened to run across Gerald Hurd's book, Pain, Sex, and Time. Being the most interesting title of the books in hand, Houston read and read the whole night through. Hurd opened Houston's mind to the idea of the transcendental. In the early 30s, he was the BBC science commentator, H.G. Wells once said that Hurd was the only person he would listen to on the wireless. Houston found something so profound in Hurd's writing that he made a vow not to read anything else by him until he finished his Ph.D., but once his union card was in hand, he would read everything by him. Gerald Hurd is almost forgotten now, but in the 1940s and 50s, he was a much sought-after lecturer and drew large crowds wherever he spoke, including the Hollywood Temple. Hurd's mystic worldview took Houston away from scientific naturalism and into the world of the transcendental. In 1944, after getting his PhD, Houston accepted a teaching position in Denver at the University of Colorado. In 1947, Houston accepted a teaching position at Washington University in St. Louis. But before moving further east, Houston decided to get in touch with Gerald Hurd. Through Hurd's publisher, he got an address at Tribuco Canyon in Southern California. Gerald Hurd and Aldous Huxley had traveled from England before the war to Hollywood and studied under Swami Prabhavananda, the founder of the Vedanta Society of Southern California. They were soon joined by Christopher Isherwood. Gerald wanted to experiment with monastic living and raise funds to build Tribuco College. Huxley spent a good deal of time there as well, including a six-week stretch while working on the perennial philosophy. Later, Hurd would donate the grounds and building to the Vedanta Society. Houston hitchhiked to Tribuco and hit it off with Hurd, who asked him if he would care to meet Aldous Huxley. Houston was eager to do so. Before leaving Southern California, Houston met with Maria and Aldous Huxley at their desert retreat. Later, Houston would describe the simple pleasures of sweeping the floors with Maria and walking into the desert with Aldous, discussing the Desert Fathers and the nature of reality. It was suggested by Hurd that once Houston settled in St. Louis, he should look up Swami Sat Prakashananda. Swami Sat Prakashananda was the go-to scholar for Prabhavananda and Nikilananda to check the validity of their translations. After Houston and his family arrived in St. Louis, he looked up the address and took a bus to the apartment building, which then housed the center. Houston recognized the format of Swami's Kata Upanishad class. It was the same format as a traditional Bible study class. A verse was read, and then the Swami would explain the substance of the passage. Houston was hooked. At first, Houston found it a little exotic, a Swami in orange robes and Hindu trappings. But on his way out, he buys a copy of the Upanishads and for the second time of his life, stayed up all night reading. What struck him was that so much truth was packed into so few words. At Washington University, the dean has decided that the school should broaden its outlook to include courses that would give students a perspective on the world, since World War II, a broader worldview would perhaps help the cause of world peace. Since Houston is the new man in the philosophy department, he is given the assignment. This is the genesis of Houston's Religion of Man, later to be retitled The World's Religions. 
Much of the material for the chapter on Hinduism came from the 10-year association between Houston and Swami Satprakashananda. Houston had said of him that he had met scholars and he had met holy men, but never before had he met both in the same person. He found himself once again on the verge of two traditions, Christianity and Hinduism, as he submitted to weekly tutorials with the renowned scholar Swami Satprakashananda. There was a moment in St. Louis, a few years, where uh, I had a dual role. I uh, was listed as associate minister at the Methodist Church nearby and was uh, president of the Vedanta Society of St. Louis, which was uh, teaching me metaphysical profundities that uh, my church certainly was not preaching, that this all came to a head on Christmas Eve because uh, there would be a four o'clock Christmas service uh, at the church, which would be a family affair in the afternoon so the children could come. And that was wonderful, Christmas music, silent night, all of that, all of the magic of Christmas and being together with our children was just glorious, but then, We would go home, have a supper, uh, put the children to bed early for their early rising. And then I would slip off to the Vedanta Society where every Christmas Eve, Swami Satpakashananda, he never varied his title, was Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And even though in the Methodist Church there was all the happiness of the family togetherness, when it came to spiritual death, what he said, the Swami said, about the incarnation fed my soul more than any Christmas sermon in the Methodist Church. Now, you see, I'm a living witness to the fact that I have drawn spiritual succor from an alien tradition which, however, was true to the metaphysical teachings of original Christianity more than my church, which had been diluted by modernism. What's not well known, even to friends of Houston and Kendra, was that they were very involved in the St. Louis Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s. Not just supporters, but active in marches, demonstrations, and lunch counter sit-ins. Houston and Kendra were among the founding members of the St. Louis chapter of the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE which carried out sustained nonviolent campaigns from 1947 to 1957, which were among the earliest in the nation to end racial segregation in public accommodations. Kendra participated in lunch counter sit-ins, and Houston brought Martin Luther King to speak at the still segregated Washington University and worked within the administration to fully desegregate. Houston had tremendous contribution to the Vedanta Society of St. Louis. He was the president of our society. He brought his students from the Washington University to Swami Satprakashananda and introduced them with the Swami. Then in 1951, Swami Satprakashananda wanted to buy a house and there was a little racial prejudice in that area at that time. The owner of the house did not want to sell the house to Swami. So the present house was bought in Houston and his wife Kendra's name. Then Houston transferred that property to the Vedanta Society. 
In the early days of television, there was a frantic search for original content to broadcast. In the mid-1950s, the local affiliate of National Education Television, NET, the precursor to PBS in St. Louis, found out that one of the most popular lectures at the local university was Houston Smith's Religion of Man courses. A producer was assigned to help turn Houston's lectures into a nationally broadcast series, which gave many Americans their first introduction to Eastern religion and Islam. We're going to talk tonight about the yoga. Now, this is a very strange word to us. In fact, uh, uh, I find myself smiling in a Western context whenever I turn to this word because, well, we associate it with the bizarre, the fantastic, the occult, maybe even the fraudulent a little bit, the fakers. Uh, this is where they come to, we come to the famous yoga position, and I want to just show you what this is. There's always a, uh, a little humor involved in this because it's so strange to us. But nevertheless, I think we ought to know what this is. They say the most effective position, which will still the mind, is the so-called yoga, the lotus posture. You, it doesn't go very well with shoes, which is why I've taken mine off. Actually, it doesn't go very well with trousers either, but we'll forget about that tonight. You put one foot up here in the lap, then all you have to do is to bring the other foot around like that. The spine must be completely straight. Now they say when you get used to this, the point is that this will put your mind at rest and keep out the bodily distractions better. The lecture series became the book, which is first published in 1958 and has since sold millions of copies. Houston's TV series and books have introduced Vedanta to millions of Americans, including householders, monks, and nuns of the Ramakrishna order. There's two ways of meeting Houston. There's one way through his books, and there's the other way of meeting Houston, which is through meeting Houston and actually being with Houston and experiencing the joy of being with Houston. I'd already met Houston through the books uh, before I met the human being Houston. And I was very impressed by the books. I, I think a lot of us were deeply moved by the religions of man, what later became the world's religions. First of all, he can write. Second of all, there was something in the, coming from the inside which was very different from other books that I'd read on religious studies. What particularly impressed me was meeting him and seeing that tie in. Because you had a man who was a, a person who was obviously a practitioner, who was coming from his experience as a scholar from the inside out, not from the outside in. So you had the, 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 the feeling of total, even more than sympathy, it was, it was a deep empathy which, which carried through. And it makes a huge difference when you read something to have that sense of, of it being an experiential. With the growing national reputation Houston earned with the publication of his book and broadcast of the TV series, he was approached by other universities, including the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which wanted to add philosophy to their math and engineering focus. In 1958, Houston accepted a position at MIT and moved his family to Boston. In 1960, Houston is given a budget to bring a guest lecturer for a semester and calls on his friend Aldous Huxley. This creates a sensation. The lecture series is wildly successful, creating traffic problems throughout the Boston area and an overflow packed hall. Huxley suggests that Houston should contact Harvard professors Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert who are doing research on the effects of psychedelic drugs on human consciousness which might hold religious significance. The point that interests me is that whereas the ordinary, everyday experience is of course absolutely essential most of the time, it's not the only possible experience. There are also other types of consciousness, I mean the artist type, the mystics type and so on, which uh, have uh, empirically an enormous value and may help people to live less self-centered and more charitable lives and more understanding lives. In 1962, Smith participated in what would later be called the Good Friday experiments, meant to induce mystical experiences through religious settings while under the influence of LSD, mescaline, and psilocybin. At the time, these drugs were not only legal, 
but considered quite legitimate research subject. There have been many books written about those early psychedelic experiments. One recent book, The Harvard Psychedelic Club, portrays Houston as the adult in the room who cautiously described the potential benefits of the drugs as well as the pitfalls and abuses that may follow. These faces may be more familiar to you. When talking about psychedelics and their connection to religious experiences, Houston cautions with a Chinese proverb, no 10 things, tell nine. Feeling that it's nearly impossible to speak on the subject without being misunderstood. I think Houston would say, drugs may be a useful signpost on the spiritual path, but the drug experience is not the destination or the means to get there. He makes the point that it's not altered states we seek, but altered traits, which fits with what Swami Prabhavananda said about the difference between the psychedelic drug experience and true spiritual experience. The religious experience changes your character. Drugs do not. Houston did a series of films with the Hartley Film Foundation on Tibet, Sufi Islam, and India. Houston loved to travel and take his students around the world to see firsthand the religions they studied set in their country of origin. Tibet became a favorite and was to become an important part of Houston's career and personal life. He helped efforts to support the exiled Tibetan Buddhist culture, which had to flee their homeland after the invasion of Tibet by China. In addition to seeing the truth, we can feel it physically with our bodies. So the Tibetans enacted the truth through gestures. Feel the unity of life, these hands are saying. Of course there is left and right, male and female, light and shadow, joy and grief. But need they quarrel? They belong together. Finally, truth can be heard, propositionally, of course, in words, but at a deeper level in music. So the Tibetans chanted, most of the time in gravelly, monotonous monotone, but punctuated periodically with something extraordinary. They discovered ways, we still don't know how, of shaping their vocal cavities to resonate overtones to the point where these became audible as distinct tones in their own right. So each Lama, thus trained, could sing chords by himself. Houston made a recording of the monks and took it back to MIT, where acoustic engineers confirmed that the monks were producing multiphonic chords when chanting. That recording of the monks is still in print, with royalties going to the Gyoto Tantric University. On one of Houston's early trips to Tibet, he met the then young Dalai Lama, who was eager to meet a scientist from MIT. Houston and the Dalai Lama became lifelong friends. Houston helped clear the way at the State Department to allow the Dalai Lama to come to the United States for the first time. Houston's quest to find examples of the perennial philosophy, the truth, with a capital T, in each of the world religions and focused on each religion's mystical traditions that can be found in Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, and the Sufis of the Islamic faith. The soul of Islam is Sufism. It arose as a reaction against the worldliness that came over Islam with its rise to power. Ascetics, some living in caves, donned coarse woolen shirts from which the word Sufi derives to protest the silks and satins of sultans and caliphs. They wanted to purify and spiritualize Islam from within, give it a deeper mystical tone infuse into it a spirit of liberty and love. Externals must yield to internals, matter to meaning, outward symbol to inner reality. Love the pitcher less, they cried, and the water more. Allah! Of course, the clearest and earliest example of the perennial philosophy is found in India's Vedic scripture and culture. 
Everything about India is different because India seems to include everything. All the main racial types have been caught in her deep net. Blacks in the south shade into wheat-colored Brahmins in the north. While in language there are so many that English must be imported for general use. On the whole, yesterday is more visible than tomorrow, with millions following a way of life that can be traced back 4,000 years. Startling purity contrasts with equally startling license. Naked voluptuaries on temple friezes vie with naked ascetics stretched on beds of nails. The paradoxes extend right up to God. 330 million deities sounds like polytheism gone haywire until we learn that nothing but the one true God even exists. Because of Houston's popularity with TV audiences, he was asked to host another NET series consisting of interviews with leading authors and intellectuals under the title of The Search for America. Later, a book of the same title was produced with excerpts from the interviews. During Houston's career, he interviewed some of the most well-known and influential religious and intellectual leaders in the U.S. and around the world, including D.T. Suzuki, Krishnamurti, Eleanor Roosevelt, John Kenneth Galbraith, Margaret Mead, Reinhold Niebuhr, and Paul Tillich, to name a few. In 1967, Houston interviewed Krishnamurti, who had hung out socially with Aldous Huxley and General Gerald Hurd. Krishnamurti was uh, raised by the Theosophists uh, from a young boy and was groomed to be the next avatar or world teacher. But in his 30s, he renounced it all and declared that seekers of truth should not accept any authority. At the time of the break, he said, I'm quoting, truth is a pathless land and you cannot approach it by any path whatsoever, by any religion or any sect. Krishnamurti was adamant about rejecting all spiritual teachers. In contrast, Houston believed that spiritual teachers could greatly help and in most cases are absolutely necessary. The clip ca this clip captures how Houston deals with ideas he found, finds implausible or just wrong. Rather than being confrontational, he gently and characteristically says, I wonder, and then continues the conversation. No dualism, you say, no separation. And in your view, is this the case that there is no separation? Absolutely there is. Do, here, do you feel any separation? Is there any separation, you, me? I said, wait, physically there is. Yeah. You have got a black suit, you're a fairer person than me. But and you so don't feel... I, if I felt a dualistic, I wouldn't even sit down to discuss it. Because I, then we would be intellectually, we play with each other. Right. Now, perhaps we're saying the same thing, but it always it comes out in my mind as a both and. We are both separate and we're and no. united. So, both. when you love both. somebody with your heart, not with your mind, do you feel separate? I do in some... It's both. I feel I, both separate and together. Then it's not love. I wonder, because love... Uh, part so. of the joy of love is the relationship which involves, in some sense, like Ramakrishna said, I don't want to be sugar. I, I don't know. Sugar. I don't know Ramakrishna. I don't want to know any authority. I don't want to quote any bird. Don't get hung up on. No, the I am. I am <laughs> sir, no, I am. Simply, I am dealing. Uh, I am. We are dealing with facts, not what somebody said. I'll just add that Houston would play the full one-hour interview for his students to gauge their attitude towards religion. After roughly a decade at Washington University in St. Louis and MIT in Boston, Houston's career took him to Syracuse University in upstate New York. In 1973, Houston accepted a position at Syracuse University. While there, he came to realize that he had left out Native American religions from his great book. In my uh, formal education of religion, I say that with a wry smile, uh, was taught that they were primitive with the pejorative uh, built solidly into that word. And therefore, 
the, no reason to pay any attention to them except for uh, historical reasons, what the old people felt way back in the childhood of the human race. I would have gone out my life in that mode if I hadn't moved to Syracuse, where providentially I was moving into the shade of the Onondaga Reservation, and that 10 years that I was there absolutely transformed my view of the indigenous religion, and I am so grateful I will not go to my grave not having entered a final chapter in the second edition of my book. Houston also became involved with the case to legalize peyote for Native American religious ritual. A decade-long struggle finally succeeded in recognizing the right to practice the religious traditions of the Native Americans. Bill Moyers is an author and journalist who had done in-depth reporting on current events ranging from politics to religion. In 1988, PBS and Bill Moyers produced a six-part series on Joseph Campbell titled The Power of Myth. The series was watched by millions. Then in 1996, Moyers and PBS produced a five-part series on the world religions titled The Wisdom of Faith with Houston Smith. What do you make of that Hindu proverb, there are realms of gold hidden in the depths of our heart? In the Upanishads, the philosophical versions and texts of Hinduism, there is a phrase that comes repeatedly like the clang of a gong. It's tat tvam asi, literally, that thou art. And what it means is the that which we seek in Brahman, the divine, whatever you call it, is right here within you. You see, they not only they begin by saying you can have what the what you want, and that sounds very good, but wait till you get to the climax and that is you've already got it. Houston's personal religious practices evolved over time starting with Sat Prakashananda. He added meditation and yoga to his regular Christian practice of reading scripture, singing hymns, and prayer. Houston would retain some of the practices from the various religions he studied throughout his life without any compromise of his core Christian beliefs and practices. He said that standing on his head was his favorite yoga posture as it raised his metabolism the most. For a time, Houston practiced Salah the Islamic practice of praying five times a day. Houston was a strong and vocal advocate of the perennial philosophy, becoming the most prominent flag bearer for the belief after Aldous Huxley. He saw it as the only plausible explanation that the same core religious truths arose independently in all major cultures of the world throughout history. Houston liked to compare what Christ taught to the four yogas of Vedanta. As Swami said, love the Lord with all thy heart, bhakti yoga with all thy soul, raja yoga, with all thy mind, jnana yoga, with all thy strength, karma yoga. Also, Houston compared the great Vedic dictum, I am Brahman, to Christ's teaching, I am the Father, am one. After retiring from full-time teaching, Houston didn't drop out of sight. He kept writing and lecturing. At one point in his 80s, he had to promise his wife Kendra to slow down and do, I'll quote, no more than one local talk per week, no more than two out-of-towners per month, and no more than two international trips per year. When we see Houston in the Bill Moyers interviews, we see him at his apex. He was in his mid-70s. Now we meet Houston in his 90s. He suffered progressive hearing loss, osteoporosis, macular degeneration, and slowing memory and organizational skills. In his mid-80s, he opted to get a cochlear implant operation, and he compensated for his memory loss by setting up a successful system of notes and papers to keep himself communicating and working. He said that correspondence that came in went in a pile and he dealt with them in order. Nobody jumped the line. 
Houston gave hundreds of interviews in his later years. I believe that the fundamental faith of all the authentic religions is it all makes sense. There is an analogy used frequently that between, well, we're asked to visualize a wonderful tapestry hanging wall ceiling to floor in uh, a museum. Our problem, the human problem is we are looking at the tapestry from the wrong side and you know <laughs> what that's like. I mean uh, bits and snippets of yarn and so on cut off. It makes no sense at all. And then the point of religion is to take us by the hand and lead us from looking at the back side to the front where it's a great work of art. For one of his last interviews, noted lecturer and gerontologist Dr. Ken Dykwald sought Houston's views on the subject of aging, life, and death. But what made Houston so dear to so many was his sense of humor and lightness. Here Ken asks what song would best describe his life. If you were to think of one song that best tells the story of your life, what song would that be? Let me see. Uh, how can I keep from singing. Do you know that song? I do not. Well, you can edit it out of the <laughs> no, film, but it's a wonderful song. <laughs> My life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentations. I hear that sure but far off tune that spells a new creation. Midst all the sorrows and the strife, I hear that music ringing. It sounds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? Well, you asked for it, so you got it. Throughout Houston's career, he maintained his connection with Vedanta, when possible going back to St. Louis and lecturing at the center. Writing forwards and introductions for books written by the Swamis of the Order and continuing as the primary flag bearer of the perennial philosophy. After retiring to Berkeley, Houston made it a point to attend the annual Memorial Day retreat in, in Olima, just north of San Francisco, hosted by the Vedanta Society of Northern California, where representatives of the world's religions are invited to talk. In the last stage of his life, Houston co-authored two books of reminiscences and saw his official biography published by Dana Sawyer, uh, written by Dana Sawyer. But eventually Houston's health gave out as he approached his late 90s. Told that he only had a few months to live, he was enrolled in home hospice care. He reported that he was in no pain and was comfortable. Slowly, Houston's senses fell from him. He was already profoundly deaf, uh, deaf even before hospice and his, then his eyesight faded, and then at times he seemed to lose all contact with the outside world. Houston's North Campus home in Berkeley was nice, but humble. For years, Houston and Kendra sponsored a multi-generational Tibetan refugee family. They lived in a detached, converted garage apartment. This family proved to be a great blessing for Houston and Kendra, as Houston's health declined. As Houston's physical condition weakened, the Tibetan family moved into the main house to care for him. At that point, there were three generations in the family, including a toddler and two rescue dogs. The family slept upstairs in what used to be Houston's bedroom and office. 
Houston slept in the downstairs bedroom, confining himself to the ground level, and Kendra slept in the garage apartment. He was not ready to give up, which made his extended hospice period so intriguing. When people came to visit, Houston knew who they were and would rise to the occasion. When we visited, he spoke about Swami Satprakashananda and how much Swami had meant to him. Similarly, when Swami Chaitanya visit, he again talked about Satprakashananda. He was in hospice, at times at death's door, for a total of two years and eight months. We can only guess at what was going on inside. His memorial was held at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco on April 1st, 2017. Welcome to everyone who is gathered to honor the uh, ever alive spirit of Houston Smith. So many of us here today found someone we were looking for when we found Houston. Our lives, it seems, had somehow disclosed to us the reality of the sacred, and we wanted to know more. Because we sought knowledge, we were looking for scholars. With a doctorate in philosophy from Chicago at age 25, Houston qualified. Because we were students, we were looking for teachers, and Houston was a gifted one, made sharper still by his early embrace of the rigors of television. Because we were readers, we were looking for writers, and Houston loved to write. He sometimes said his favorite way to pray was with a pencil in his hand. Eventually, there were 14 books and over 100 articles. Because some of us had encountered entheogens, we were delighted to find someone who was soberly sympathetic. In 1964, Houston published Do Drugs Have Religious Import? The most anthologized piece ever to appear in that journal's history reprinted in 14 books. Because we had been born into a globalizing world, we were looking for a universalist who found it unthinkable that the infinite could privilege any particular culture or institution. Long before I was a perennialist, Houston once said, I was a universalist. And because we were hungry for authenticity, we were looking for someone who laid himself open to traditional methods of attunement to the ground of being, as Houston did. All this would have been quite enough, but the wonder that was Houston also came wrapped, as George Hart once put it, in an incomparable combination of personal warmth, infectious humor, exceptional clarity, and unobtrusive but palpable spirituality. It is no wonder then that when we did find Houston, whenever and wherever we found him, we leaned toward him like plants toward sunlight. As the recognized Dean of World Religious Studies, Houston was often invited to be the keynote speaker at interfaith gatherings, as was the case in this one held in 2006 in San Francisco, featuring Houston's old friend, the Dalai Lama. He supported interfaith meetings and felt there was two important principles which had to be upheld and when required, defended. The first was that all the traditional religions are true and all lead to union with our divine nature. This was first expressed in the Rig Veda. There is one reality, the wise call it by many names. 
there is one truth reached by many paths. Houston also insisted that one should choose a path and then stick with it. He argued against what he called cafeteria religion, taking a bit of this and a bit of that, but avoiding what you think might be unpleasant. Houston himself added spice from other religions to his constant and stable diet of Christianity. As Ramakrishna said in the gospel, you must stick with one path with all your strength. A man can reach the roof of a house by stone stairs or a ladder or a rope or even by a bamboo pole, but he cannot reach the roof if he sets foot now on one, now on another. He should firmly follow one path. I'll let Houston have the last word. First of all, I would like to introduce my dear friend, Houston Smith. Professor Houston Smith will say a few words first. I have a pretty good projection voice. Do I need a no, microphone? <laughs> what shall I do? I'm already wired. <laughs> My other and final comment is someone once asked Mahatma Gandhi, wouldn't it be wonderful if goodness were as contagious as the common cold? <laughs> and he answered, when will we ever learn that goodness is as contagious as the common cold. So I'm going to leave this day a better person. The goodness of His Holiness and all of us who are joined together in the noble task because I've caught the contagious <laughs> from you and from all of you. Because Houston was profoundly deaf, he couldn't hear the thunderous standing ovation he was receiving. Like Beethoven, he had to be turned to face the audience. <laughs> Strive, those freedom bells come ringing since love is Lord of heaven and earth. How can I keep from singing? My life flows on in endless song. My love flows on in endless song. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you, John, sharing your wonderful presentation to our friends and devotees in St. Louis. <coughs> While watching, so many memories came to my mind. I still remember. He was talking about Krishna Murti. It was in early 70s from Santa Barbara. I went to Ohio to listen to his lecture. He was pounding, destroy all this guru business. No guru, no human being, nothing. Then when the lecture was over, I went to him, I said, but you are teaching, then why are you teaching? You are a guru. <laughs> he apologized me, he did not answer my question, he left. <laughs> I personally am very grateful to Houston because whenever I need any 
blurred or some kind of quotes and introduction from our our publications he always wrote something i remember when i was working vedanta voice of freedom he wrote the preface then vivekananda the east meets west he wrote the introduction and all the books i wrote whenever he was well he always wrote and introduced our books to the western audience i personally very grateful to him i still remember one day in cancer city i was in my room and he was sleeping in the other room our guest room swami please knock at my door when you go to the shrine if i fall asleep please knock at my door but before i knock he got up came to the shrine we meditated together then in the breakfast table we were talking about gita he was assigned to write five introduction of the five world's classics pilgrim's way christianity gita then rumi's book in islam then any of five i don't remember all the five books he was assigned i think harper or row or famous company publisher he is supposed to write the introduction so i talked about gita nearly breakfast table one hour gone we are talking about gita what are the characteristics of the bhagavad gita the swami forget the lecture let us talk only about gita <laughs> then i said houston do you know i have a sentence sometimes some people you know famous court i have a court gossip spreads faster than the gospel Shami, wait. Let me write down. Remember <laughs> what you said. Full of humor. Very wise person. Very deep, profound. Humble, universal. Seldom we find this kind of person in the West or in the in the world. Majadu Shatru. man that person's enemy has not been born houston was such a person a great soul though he is not with us physically but his ideas his thoughts will continue and i am very thankful to you john to show this wonderful thing to our devotees and friends here to and i think we recorded it and we shall we shall use it again in the future the great person and a great supporter of our society till then when i went to see him perhaps he saw his picture i was he was in bed and i was he was taking a picture of his friend swami he was inquiring about virginia about our house society is going on even at the at that time and i am so grateful to that he showed that tibetan family they lived in the same house they keep him alive his body you know was lying down for months years room was Ekar clean, bed clean. The way those people take care of that, even a person's children will not take care of the way this Kibitian family took care of Houston. Kendra was old. Kendra's wife could not took care of her, took care of him. Children are out, but he was not neglected. He died very peacefully. anyhow we are very grateful to him thank you very much john to show this multimedia presentation to us